Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our 2016 nine-month sales conference here in Vevey. This conference will be held in English, but you can also follow it in French or German using your headsets. Uh, if you're watching the webcast, you can choose the right language by clicking on the respective link on the webcast page. On the podium, uh, we have our CEO Paul Bouquet and our CFO François-Xavier Roger. Uh, I take the safe harbor statement as read. Now let's start. Paul, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, welcome to our 2016 nine-month uh, uh, sales conference. Also welcome to all of you who are following this conference uh, through the webcast. You saw uh, the figures uh, which we published this morning. Um, over the nine first months of, of 2016, we achieved sales of 65 uh, billion and a half Swiss francs with uh, an organic growth of 3.3% and a real internal growth of 2.5%. In this uh, soft trading environment, which is marked by deflation and low uh, raw material prices, we, we, ha we have continued to privilege volume growth, which is at the higher end of, of the industry, and that in both emerging and developed markets. But at the same time, our pricing remains soft, but is increasing. Our growth was also broad-based across categories, with, which allowed us to gain or maintain market shares in most of our businesses. We are also making good progress in addressing our challenges and driving our different initiatives amidst the, this generally softer trading environment. We also continue to invest for the future, that in line with our strategy. We maintain a high level of brand support while continuing to build an innovation pipeline, both globally and locally. And at the same time, we drive more operational and structural efficiencies through standardizing, sharing, and scaling more and more activities above market. Now, for the full year, and considering the current software environment, we expect Nestle to deliver organic growth of around 3.5%, with improvements in margins and, and underlying earnings per share in constant currencies, and increased capital efficiency. But let me now hand over for more details to you, Francois. Please. Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning to all. In the first nine months of 2016, our sales reached 65.5 billion Swiss francs. RIG stood at 2.5%. <coughs> I remind you that RIG is a combination of volume and mix. OG is at 3.3%. We had a negative foreign exchange deviation of minus 1.7%. And net divestment, MA, had the minus 0.6% effect. As a consequence, our reported sales increased by 1%. In a context of deflation and weaker consumer demand, we deliver a solid rig and we gain or maintain market share in almost 60% of our business sales. This reflects the resilience of our portfolio and our strong execution capabilities in a difficult context. Pricing remains low, but with some sequential improvements since June, mainly <coughs> coming from Brazil <coughs> and Russia. First, uh, looking at our performance by geography, I remind you that this split includes our zones on our GMBs. Our growth has been broad-based across the three zones. In America's rig was 2.3%, with OG of 4.8%. Emena had rig of 2.4%, with OG of 2.1%. And finally, AOA had rig of 3%, with OG of 2.5%. This is relatively consistent with the shape of growth that we saw in H1. The main variance come from the half year comes from Zone Americas, where we rebalance our growth from volume to value, mainly in Brazil. Looking now at uh, the shape of our growth between developed and emerging market, developed markets account for 58% of group sales, while emerging markets are accounting for 42%. Organic growth is pretty consistent with what we, have in, what we had in H1, with developed markets growing 1.9% and emerging market by 5.3%. The notable change is that pricing improved in emerging markets while rig was softer, and the biggest driver of that was Brazil. In developed markets, the dynamic was more consistent with positive rig driven by innovation and continued negative pricing in a deflationary environment. As we don't, and, and we don't see really any improvement in pricing in developed markets in the short term. Moving to our businesses by reporting segment, and I will start with Zone AMS. 
We achieved sales of 18.8 billion, OG of 4.5% and RIG of 1.6%. In North America, the environment remains deflationary, reflecting both low commodity pricing and pricing pressure in the market. RIG remains solid, but decreased slightly from H1. Pet care and coffee mate remains at, as key growth drivers. Frozen food continue to grow well, with further mar market share gains. After a complete overall of the marketing mix, Frozen has reached a normalized level of low to mid single digit growth. Confectionery in the US remains difficult, with pressure on the entire category. Latin America is still a mixed picture. Mexico is one of the leading performers for the group, with good growth across all categories. Brazil remains positive, with a different growth profile. We implemented some price increases in recent months, mainly in dairy, but we did it as well in other categories like cocoa and malt beverages, chocolate and coffee. Our price increases have had an impact on volume in the short term, as we anticipated, as the trade had, in had increased their inventories before the price increases. Volume started to stabilize towards the end of the period, but we need to remain cautious on Brazil because we don't, uh, we, the environment is quite unstable at this stage. Moving now to zone EMENA, we had sales of 12.2 billion, 2.2% of OG, and 2.7% of RIG. The momentum differs across the three subregions of the zones, but overall we continue to see good RIG momentum driving market share gains across geographies. Going by subregion, and I will start with Western Europe, pricing remains negative with deflation across geographies. We had good rig performances in France, in Germany, in, uh, in uh, Southern Europe. I would talk there about uh, Spain, Portugal, and Italy. The UK has been notably more challenging f since the half year, uh, mainly in confectionery and coffee. By product category in Western Europe, Dolce Gusto, Pet Care, and frozen pizzas were the key growth drivers. Central and Eastern Europe had both positive rig and pricing. Overall, we continue to gain market share in the region. Russia remains a leading performer with double-digit growth driven by both rig and pricing. However, Poland, the Baltics, and Ukraine have been more challenging. Petcare continues to do exceptionally well in the region with strong double-digit growth. And Nescafe Soluble Coffee is still enjoying a very good growth as well. Middle East and North Africa overall maintain positive results, but with a mixed picture by country. Turkey remains a key growth driver with double-digit growth, along with North, the North and Af East Africa regions. The Middle East is more challenging, and the ongoing instability has impacted our ability to supply countries like Iraq, Yemen, or Syria. Finally, in Emena, we are happy to confirm the start of our operations at Fronery, our new ice cream joint venture. We will move to equity accounting for this business from the 1st of October 2016, and we are very excited about the significant potential for value creation through this partnership. Moving now to zone AOA, with sales of 10.6 billion, 2.8% of OG, and 2.7% of RIG. The majority of markets in AOA are showing a good and sustainable growth with meaningful market share gains. This includes some categories in China, but as, is, as expected, Yinlu remained challenging and diluted the growth acceleration of AOA since June. Southeast Asia has maintained its uh, high single-digit growth. Most markets perform strongly, from Indonesia to the Philippines and Vietnam. This strong performance was driven by Milo, coffee, ready-to-drink beverages, and Maggi. Sub-Saharan Africa continued to grow well across most categories, especially with Maggi and overall the affordability range, what we call PPP. Within the region, countries like Nigeria, Angola, Ghana, Ivory Coast are the highlights. And as far as developed market is concerned, Japan's solid growth continue to build on innovation and premiumization, mainly with Nescafe and KitKat. Oceania is still under pressure, mainly from pricing, in a very challenging trade landscape with intense retail competition. Moving to India, we have made a strong return to growth in the market. 
Maggie noodles have continued to gain market share since uh, the relaunch, and we are now at 58% market share. And sales are back to about 80% of the pre-crisis levels, ahead of expectations, and our strategy to continue engaging with uh, consumers, even at the heart of the crisis, is really paying off now. Looking in more details at China, <coughs> the market remains rather challenging. The uh, food and beverage categories in which we operate are basically flat in terms of growth. But we have performed well in coffee and chocolate, as both had double-digit growth. As we said at uh, this year's investor seminar in May, the turnaround of Yinlu will take time, as trading conditions remain difficult. Now let's move to uh, our globally managed businesses, and I will start with Nestle Waters. We had sales of 6.1 billion, with 4.2% of OG and 4.4% of RIG. Nestle Waters delivered solid growth in all geographies, with strong growth in emerging markets. We also saw solid growth in Europe, in spite of the very challenging comparatives. The US grew well, despite the fact that we lost some sales from the destruction of one of our factories in Texas by a tornado earlier in the year. The international premium brands, Perry and San Pellegrino, continued to drive an attractive performance across markets. Nestle Pure Life remains accretive to growth for the water uh, business, and there were strong contributions from many of our iconic local brands. I would mention their Poland Springs in the US, Buxton in the UK, or Santa Maria in Mexico. Moving to Nestle Nutrition, we had sales of 7.7 .7 billion, 1.3% of OG, and 0.8% of RIG. Our modest, modest growth reflects the category dynamics in our two largest markets, namely China and the US. In China, our biggest market, the category is basically flat. Low dairy prices and the challenging competitive environment, we have there more than 100 players, continue to impact the market. We start seeing as well some inventory destocking in the trade ahead of the new regulation that will be introduced at the beginning of 2018. Premium and mainstream segments have taken the largest hit with uh, significant price reductions. We are more focusing on the uh, super premium uh, segment and our super premium brand Iluma continued its uh, excellent growth at over 30% year to date, confirming our leadership in the segment. Overall, in China for nutrition, we are gaining market share and we are consolidating our leadership position. Whilst we are losing a small amount of share in offline channels, we are making strong gains in the online B2C channel. Moving to the US for nutrition, we experienced some pressure from uh, the beginning of the year following the transition to new packaging for meals and drinks from uh, glass to plastic. We also had some supply issues with pouches, but this is largely behind us now and we are starting to regain positive momentum in the US. We had good performances in a number of other markets across Latin America and Asia. I would mention there Brazil, Mexico, the Philippines, and Indonesia, and Indonesia, just to name a few. However, the social and political instability in the Middle East has impacted our ability to supply the market. Let's move now to uh, our other businesses, which include professional, uh, Nespresso, Nestle Health Science, and Nestle Skin Health. We had sales of 10.1 billion, OG of 4.6% and RIG of 4%. Starting with Nestle Professional, this uh, division grew in both emerging and developed markets, although Europe continues to be a little bit tough. We have announced earlier this month a change in the business structure of Nestle Professional, which will uh, start with effective, which will be effective from the 1st of January 2017. We will be merging Nestle Professional into the zones with the support of a, strategic of a strategic business unit. We believe the new structure will allow us to better leverage market-specific knowledge and platforms. We will restate our group accounts next year in order to allow comparison. Moving now to Nespresso. Nespresso maintained its uh, good growth momentum across all regions. The geographic expansion continued. We opened 21 new boutiques across the world since the beginning of the year. Europe's growth remains solid and resilient in the context of an increased competition and higher penetration rates. And we have seen a strong momentum in the US driven by the virtual line system. Talking about the virtual line system, we have now even launched 
this system in France at the beginning of, uh, of this month. And we also see double-digit growth for Nespresso across AOA and Latin America. Moving to Nestle Health Science, which performed well, we have seen double-digit growth in our consumer care business, driven by Boost and Carnation Breakfast Essentials in the US. We rolled out Meritain in Europe, and it is going very well. And we have a strong <coughs> pipeline for further geographic expansion for our consumer care franchise globally. Medical nutrition also delivered good growth, driven by our allergy portfolio, uh, mainly in China. Moving to Nestle Skin Health, our consumer business has performed well, driven by the Cetaphil and Delong lines. Aesthetic and correctives has also gained momentum with market share gains in the US. The uh, RX business, the prescription business, is more complicated with some pressure from generic su substitution overall for the category as well. Moving now to product categories, I will not spend too much time here because we covered most aspects as part of the zones on globally managed businesses. Uh, we'll just cover quickly powdered and liquid beverages that had a strong and consistent performance, driven by continued good growth momentum across Nescafe Dolce Gusto, soluble coffee, as well as Nespresso, as I just mentioned. Overall, for coffee, we gain a further market share during the period. Waters, we have discussed already. Uh, milk product and ice cream, the performance of uh, this line is impacted by Yinlu, which we have already discussed. In terms of uh, dynamics since June, pricing has accelerated, whilst rig has slowed down, which largely reflects the pricing action that we had in Brazil and that I mentioned earlier. Nutrition and health science include Nestle Nutrition, Nestle Health Science, and Nestle Skin Health, and we have already talked about it, so I won't repeat myself. Prepared dishes and cooking aid, it, uh, it improved since uh, H1 with a successful relaunch of Maggi noodles in India. And we are also seeing sustained good results in US frozen, particularly with Link Cuisine and Staffers. Confectionery remains under pressure with negative rig. We face challenges in the uh, mainstream chocolate market in the US, as well as some softness in Brazil and also in the UK. KitKat continues to do well globally. Uh, we are addressing our challenges in confectionery through innovation and marketing support behind our brands. Petcare, to finish, has maintained its uh, good growth momentum with strong contribution from Latin America <coughs> and Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, and with very good market, market share gains across uh, zones. The US continues to perform well for, for Petcare, and we have recently relaunched both Beneful and Darkshaw. In summary, we feel these results demonstrate our resilient portfolio and strong execution, which is supporting real internal growth momentum in a context of weaker consumer demand globally. We continue to make further market share gains, and in the current climate, this volume-driven growth is unique and differentiating in the industry, and it reflects our long-term value creation model. By growing volume and premiumizing, we are creating substance and bringing relevance to both our consumers and to the trade. Pricing does remain low due to the deflationary environment, but we saw some improvement since H1. For the full year 2016, considering the softer environment, we now expect to deliver organic growth of around 3.5%, improvements in margins and underlying earning per share in constant currency, and increased capital efficiency. Now I will hand, hand over to Paul for his final remarks. Well, uh, thank you, Francois. Uh, well, these figures uh, reflect indeed a global soft trading environment. But our volume growth, our volume growth is a point of differentiation. What this figure also reflects is the fundamental resilience and, and, and strength of our portfolio. The, the fact that our growth is broad-based. We, we grow both in emerging and in developed markets. Uh, we grow consistently uh, across a wide range of, of different categories and businesses. But what they don't fully reflect yet are, are the many innovations, actions, and initiatives that we have been taking and are taking to, to strengthen our portfolio, where, where we explore and invest in new avenues for future value growth. And the many initiatives and programs that we are implementing to be, to be leaner, 
and more efficient and cost effective as a company. That is what we have been doing through our 150 years of history. Permanently challenging ourselves, reinventing ourselves so that we can compete successfully. And that is again what we are doing today, challenging and reinventing ourselves. Yes, we have to care for the short term. Yes, we have to perform. But at the same time, we have also to invest and make choices to build for long term. These are important times, times where with, with so many challenges and opportunities converging, times to do the right things, to shape the future and to set up our company for long-term success. And to do this, innovation. It's all about innovation. Innovation is at the core of everything we do. It starts with innovating and renovating what we have, our products, our brands, formulating and reformulating thousands and thousands of products each year, adding value to them, and adapting them to the evolving expectations of consumers and society. Our product innovation is broad, it is diverse, it is global and local, and it leverages our unique R&D capabilities. Often these innovations are small incremental improvements, but it is also about putting resources behind bold and disruptive ideas and giving them the time to develop, like we did with, with Nespresso 30 years ago. Uh, Nespresso has evolved to what it is now today, a global iconic brand present in almost 70 markets and countries, completely redefining how we enjoy the best cup of coffee. And with the new virtual line, which we are now extending from the US to Europe, we are bringing a new dimension to it. And the same goes for Nescafe Dolce Gusto, a global beverage system now that we built in just 10 years and also present in 90 markets already. And that goes also for Purina Beyond, beyond in, pet, in pet food, Iluma in infant formula, or the rollout of Boost and Marathon to answer the needs of an aging population. And I could go on. But innovation is not just in products and systems or services. It's also about new businesses and business models like our joint venture of Froneri that just, just started. Here we are combining our ice cream business with R&R to create a leading player with presence in more than 20 countries. It's all about innovation. Also innovation in the ways we work, how we organize ourselves. And that is what uh, Nestle Business Excellent is all about. Over 10 years ago, Globe gave us a significant competitive advantage. Globe was about processes, systems, data. And now Nestle Business Excellence is taking this all to a next level. It is redesigning our processes and structures for the future, simplifying and on average cutting the steps involved by half. It is about realizing the benefits of scale and skills and rewiring completely how we work as a company. We are organizing ourselves through Nestle Business Excellence in a way that, that frees up our markets, our operations in the countries to focus on, on what matters consumers and customers, on innovation and on generating demand. It is a multi-year journey and uh, we are halfway through. This is also linked to how we further leverage our procurement above market level, how we revisit our global industrial setup and other initiatives. We are all about innovation. Innovation also with digital, where we are going beyond communication and e-commerce and commerce by building digital ecosystems, engaging and working with all relevant players, global and local, small and big. And finally, Innovation is also about pushing the boundaries, the boundaries of nutrition. And this is also what we're doing now through our new platforms, Nestle Health Science and, and Nestle Skin Health. These businesses are shaping entirely new opportunities that entail a fascinating promise of growth and value creation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Nestle is about consistency. Nestle is about continuity permanently balancing the taking care of the short term while at the same time building and investing for the future. 
Uh, this has characterized us during 150 years. And that is exactly what we're doing today. As I said, these are special times, times where we don't want to compromise, and that in order to get even stronger. Now, I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, Robin, take uh, over. For those of you um, on the call, uh, if you want to ask a question, please press star one on your phones to join the queue. If you want to withdraw your question, please press star two. Please limit yourself to uh, two questions. Uh, now, but now let's take the first question from the call. Um, Warren Ackerman of the Société Générale. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Warren Ackerman here at uh, SOCGEN. Um, two, qu two questions, please. The first one is actually for François Xavier. If I take you back to the first half results, you were confident that you could get back to the Nestlé model or, or around 5% <clears throat> or close to 5%, and here we are at close to 3% in Q3, so a marked slowdown rather than an acceleration. <clears throat> My question is, were you not too bullish back at H1? And what has been the biggest variance versus your expectations in Q3? I mean, you already knew that China and Brazil were very tough back then. I mean, have they got materially worse, or has category growth rate slowed materially in Q3? <clears throat> and then the second question is on pricing. Um, I mean, commodity prices are now turning, you know, sugar, dairy, but you're still saying you don't expect any improvement in pricing in the short term. <clears throat> And what does this say about Nestle's pricing ability globally? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Warren. I will answer the first question. Uh, in H1, we said that we expected indeed a growth acceleration in uh, H2, which was mainly driven by pricing, which actually happened because we implemented pricing in Brazil, in Russia, and in other geographies. Uh, we expected as well to get an acceleration coming from easier comps because we had a one-off adjustment last year. It happened as well because of innovation, which happened as well, and portfolio management. But portfolio management is something that will happen in Q4 because this is linked to the uh, Froneri deconsolidation. Um, we had said as well at, uh, at that time that there were a couple of risks. One of them was the impact on volume in the short term due to the price increases that we have put through. Some of it happened, and especially in Brazil. Also at the end of the period in Q3, we started to be back to um, positive volume growth in Brazil. So there was not really a negative elast elasticity. As I said earlier, there was a little bit of piling of inventory maybe by the trade before we put through the price increases and then some adjustment in July and August, but we were back to the normal situation at the end of September. What uh, I would say surprised us a little bit is a general soft conception across the region, which we didn't expect. Um, and I think that through that, we can see that the growth is relatively fragile in the fast-moving consumer industry overall. I don't think it's only for us. I think it has been reflected as well in markets in general. Moving to your second question on commodity pricing, we have seen uh, indeed over the last two quarters some increase in commodity pricing. It doesn't reflect fully yet in terms of uh, pricing because we have some inventory first and we have uh, put in place some hedging. Uh, so usually there is a six to nine months delay between the uh, commodity pricing in the market and uh, the time when it impacts our, our P&L. So I don't think that we can conclude uh, anything at this stage con uh, in terms of pricing power. We are confident that we have good pricing power because of the strengths of our brands overall. But on growth, it's true that actually uh, I'm an optimist and uh, I wouldn't say bullish. Uh, and it's true also that the deflationary environment is somewhere uh, lasting and is deeper and lasting longer uh, than we all would have expected. And uh, pricing, we backed off. We have pre we are privileging uh, through all the initiatives we have in innovation, etc. Volume growth because that is what sticks. We saw some pricing. We thought we had more pricing needs uh, than actually, considering the deflationary environment, we actually have to. Uh, apply. That is what combining these two things is uh, what brought us where we are. And uh, I would just want to stress again, uh, we have volume growth linked with market share gains uh, on the higher end of the whole industry. And, and that is what stays afterwards. And so, um, yes, uh, that's why we uh, projected 3.5% uh, for the full year. 
thanks, Paul. Uh, the next question from the call is from Eileen Koo, Morgan Stanley. Oh, well, morning, gentlemen. Um, it's Eileen Koo here, uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is actually, <clears throat> I suppose, on the pricing market share equation. Uh, obviously, you're talking about the fact that you're prioritizing uh, volume and market share. But I suppose now that you're starting to take pricing, are you seeing that reverse? Um, so can you talk about that generally? And then secondly, when you talk about guidance being, you know, now around three and a half for the full year, does that, I mean, am I right in, in understanding that that implies a acceleration in the 4Q? And if so, what confidence do you have that momentum will improve? Is it to do with the innovation pipeline that you alluded to earlier? Can you just give us a bit of clarity on that? That would be great. Thank you. Well, pricing and volume is always a, a, a fiddle line. You know, and we always say pricing is done locally. There's no such thing as a global dimension or a global instruction uh, of our company. But if you have a lot of efforts going on in innovation, if you have a lot of brand support, etc., that has to reflect in your market positions and, 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 and driving the categories. We have leadership in many, many markets. So it is for us to drive these categories in a, a deflationary soft environment. That is what we're doing. That's where these uh, uh, market um, uh, and uh, shares and volumes are coming into play. This is important to us. As I mentioned, that is what stays. Um, when we do pricing, yes, you have certain effects. Uh, we saw that uh, to a certain extent in Brazil, uh, where we had uh, quite substantial uh, pricing in certain categories. And, and there you have a certain uh, adjustment. You have always a little bit on, up front of uh, pricing some, some, some uh, um, retail uh, actions, etc. But then... Uh, we saw it straight away coming back. The strength of brands and the strength of the support behind our brands is what, at the end of the day, stays, as I said, sticks. And that is what we are looking for. Just to be, to be more specific, if, we, if I take the example of Brazil, we increased our prices significantly in June. That being said, we continued uh, seeing our market share increasing in Q3, so which means that uh, we managed to handle it, uh, I think, very well. Uh, but obviously, we change the profile of our growth from, from as far as Brazil is concerned, from uh, volume to value in Q3. Uh, you were talking about Q4. Um, you know, the, um, the our guidance for 3.5 percent this year is actually very close to where we are today at 3.3. Uh, so we um, we see some color col coming back from innovation, from pricing, uh, obviously. But we want to be cautious in view of the. Uh, conception slowdown that we noticed across the board in Q3 uh, for us and for our markets. Now we saw it in the third quarter already some pricing that's going to be part of that too. So that's why uh, we project 3.5%, around 3.5%. Okay, thanks. But now take the, let's take the first question from the room, Ralph. Ralph Atkins from the Financial Times. Uh, Mr. Bukulis, your uh, last press conference, I understand, as chief executive, um, yet again, uh, sales are below the long-term target. You have 5 to 6%. Do you think this 5 um, to 6% long-term target is going to remain? Um, and second question on um, the UK. Can you tell us what uh, your intentions are as regards pricing in the UK, given the um, fall in the pound recently? How much is a Kit Kat going to cost in the UK? Thank you. Well, uh, you, you, you said it, this long-term target of 5 to 6 percent, I say, no, that's our ambition. And uh, that's something that we are building this company for over time. These are now a few years of uh, very, very soft trading environments and deflationary environment where the low uh, raw material prices, etc. So that's why um, uh, we, we speak about a projecting of 3.5 percent for this year. Um, but what matters to me is that it's on the higher end of the, of the industry, especially in volumes. And again, I repeat, that is what matters. It's a relative game towards uh, winning in the marketplace. And that too, as I mentioned before, uh, 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 an innovation drive. I think innovation, uh, having the initiative, driving your categories, that is what matters. And uh, that's where we invest in. Also building the capabilities of having uh, out of this softer environment that we all live with, uh, to come out as a company much stronger and not uh, going for short-term bypasses. Uh, I think that's an obligation uh, uh, that the that, uh, leadership of a company has to do. That is what we're doing. Uh, so we don't make these trade-offs um, so easily for growth for the future. So uh, this ambition uh, stays. 
these ambitious days. Now, in the UK, um, that's a question that we have uh, read quite a little bit about. Uh, first of all, I want to say pricing is done in the markets. So pricing is done in the UK by our people there. And what they do is consider all, um, uh, all elements. Uh, you refer to the fact that the devaluation may induce some need for, they're going to have to sort it out and to do that responsibly again. Uh, that means seeing all other possible actions to, um, to, to absorb the maximum of the needs. We produce actually uh, almost over 90% of all what we sell in the UK locally. So there's quite a lot of local dimension in that uh, absorbs quite a bit of that need. Um, I think KitKat is going to stay a very, a very enjoyable great break. So um, I don't see uh, that in the short term turning differently. The next question uh, comes from the call. Uh, John Cox of Kepler. Kepler, John, you have the floor. Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, just a, a question. Uh, well, I actually have two questions. One is a margin question. Uh, obviously, you've got a lot of headwinds uh, this year in terms of top line. You've said that you will deliver more than maybe we've got used to in terms of margin. I see consensus is around for a 40, 40 basis point margin improvement this year. Um, are you comfortable uh, with that uh, currently? That's the first question. And a second question, really on sort of a slowdown in food or, or packaged goods uh, you guys alluded to, and something of a, I wouldn't call it a crisis within packaged goods, but a feeling that things have decelerated and they are unlikely to come back anytime soon. I wonder if you can just, you know, give your thoughts on that. You know, what, what can you do as a leader in the industry to try and, uh, you know, get growth going? Um, or is it, you know, is it to, you need to focus on more innovative products? Um, you know, it seems that a lot of the small startup independents or local players uh, are winning share from the big packaged uh, producers, which are maybe seen as, you know, not producing not particularly healthy food. Why don't you just give us some thoughts uh, on that? Thank you. Well, what we say is that uh, we have uh, uh, growth with margin increase, and uh, that combines many things. I don't uh, uh, pronounce on numbers or specific on that. I, I, I also believe in the continuum of year after year having margin increase, which is actually linked with our strategy, more than just going after margin for margin. Um, uh, we also combining that margin increase with upfront deeper investments behind brands. You have seen it over the year, last years. We have increased our brand support, uh, supporting our innovation. We are investing more in R&D because I feel the differentiation and the, uh, and the drive, the engine behind growth for the future is going to be new products, exactly answering your second question. Uh, that is what's going to drive. And we as market leader in many categories have to do that. And we see many areas in our portfolio that are growing very handsomely. Uh, so we... And that is basically true innovation. You mentioned small players finding, uh, finding angles. We have to cover these angles too, and we can, and we have uh, uh, through, what, for example, what we have done by, by relaunching uh, 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 our frozen business in the United States that are growing uh, above our average. So these are the things we have to do. Uh, I don't feel uh, that, that uh, our industry per se is, 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 is there to be uh, low growth as an industry. I do see, if you think about, uh, when we have been speaking about the millenniums, how they pressure and, and how they value food much more in their lives and, and for that spend more on food, I see actually upsides. If you see uh, the new venues we are, we are, we are exploring and investing in, uh, they have still to come to bear uh, the growth uh, momentum that I definitely believe it's in there. Uh, uh, in Nestle Health Science, um, they're already a creative on, on, on our sales growth. Well, that is going to uh, gain momentum over time. These are all dimensions that society is embracing, that consumers are valuing and are going uh, uh, to uh, make part of their lives and as such also uh, uh, buy products from. But yeah, these are the quite, uh, I would say, uh, new connections that we as a company are making that are having and entailing a good promise of value growth. Then you see these shifts in, in, in commerce. I, I, I tell you, we are uh, living on an inflection point in society too, and, and, and how a whole industry is adapting to that. You speak about um, uh, the commerce, e-commerce, and the digital um, uh, ecosystems that are building up. It's not only commerce or only social media. It goes much beyond that. And, and, these are, um, and that's why I say these are ideal times. These are ideal times of a company like Nestle to invest. So 
if you combine all that, we are also uh, uh, increasing our efforts in, in adapting, considering these inflection points, our, our organization. Nestle Business Excellence is, is part of that. This is not, this is not small. This is uh, overarching the whole organization uh, of, of Nestle and in all countries. It is really resetting, uh, call it reinventing, challenging uh, the, 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 the structures we have today. This is rewiring uh, in a much more, call it the fourth industrial revolution. At the end of the day, uh, we are in the process on that inflection point of, of, of uh, adapting and anticipating and structuring and investing. So we have also, and that is all covered by, by the figures we're promising, but uh, a substantial more, call it restructuring per se, or uh, building new dimensions into this company that are all covered by the same promise of higher margin. I think that is the quality of, of, of what we uh, promise on, on, the, on the bottom line. Just maybe to complement what Paul said on the, on the margin. So we are committed to deliver a trading operating profit margin improvement this year. This is part of our model. This is part of our guidance. We just reiterated it. So we will do it again this year. Be aware of the fact that our trading operating profit is after restructuring. And we are going to do more restructuring this year. We didn't do that much in the first half, but we will do more in the second half uh, as part of the um, structural uh, saving program that we have announced in our Capital Market Day a few months ago. So we will increase restructuring this year, but we will increase, obviously, our trading operating margin after restructuring as it is part of our model and guidance. But let me stress a point, uh, John. Thank you for your question, actually, because it goes beyond uh, margin. We could sit here also and promise margin and say, let's have 100 uh, uh, basis points. I cut a little bit of uh, my support behind the brands and we have actually added to it. We do a little bit less here, a little bit less of longer term because at the end of the day, longer term or medium term, uh, uh, we can sit. We have brand momentum, so uh, uh, brand strength. So I tell you one thing. Uh, that is exactly what we should not do, uh, uh, because that creates what I call um, uh, business anemia or company anemia. And, and, and it's that balancing out uh, uh, that, 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 that is what we want to be as a company, balancing out this, this continuous delivering, um, uh, because it is intrinsic to, to our strategy, added value, uh, 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 more efficiencies, that should reflect on the bottom line. Uh, but at the end also continues in, in investing so that we have this fine balance of, of, of uh, short, long, and medium and long term. And, and I think uh, that is what brought us here as a company. So during now 150 years, this is an anniversary year. Um, uh, that is what we do now today. We can do that uh, today because somebody did it in the past. Well, I want whoever comes after to say the same things. Uh, but you have to balance it out. Yes, you have to deliver today, too. That's what we call the model. Um. The next question is from the call uh, from James Target to Berenberg. James, you have the floor. James? Okay, let's take the next question from the room. Um, John? Uh, John Revel, Reuters. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, a couple of points. I was wondering, just following up to um, Ralph's point, could I have a little bit more colour on how you see the UK market developing in the future, post-Brexit, and also how will this, will this affect your um, investments in the country? That's first point. And then secondly, you said that 90% um, of your products are produced in the UK, but obviously you still want to buy quite a lot of commodities to go into your factories in the UK, so the currency shock is going to have some effect. So can you give us some kind of, kind of colour on the effect of the currency shock, how that will affect pricing there? I know you do it locally, but there's got to be some kind of ballpark guidelines there. And then secondly, you've talked in very broad terms about innovation and things like that to drive growth moving forward. Is there any kind of specific examples you can refer us to or give us a bit more specifics on how you think you're going to get pricing back moving forward? Thank you. Well, it's first Brexit gives get some form and shape and definition because we all speak Brexit. I wouldn't speak about uh, Brexit until they really landed, what it means and all that. But fact is, uh, uh, our investments, uh, we, we're going to see, we have invested uh, quite heavily in, 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 in the UK. And uh, so whatever they export again, 
uh, well, the added value they deliver is actually making them more competitive on that sense uh, for what they, and we export quite a bit to, to Europe from uh, the UK. So uh, we have an investment plan that is basically a long-term uh, structure. So we're not going to start now revisiting all the investment we did and starting to, to readjust that. Let's first let the dust settle um, and, and to give that some perspective. Investments are long-term commitments. So we're not going to uh, start doing sh short-term uh, dimensions and, and corrections and decision-making on something that is, for us, medium-long-term. Even more so, as I, what I said before, let's Brexit first get some form and shape. Uh, then uh, on, uh, we, we do import. Yes, do. We, we, are, we, are, we have cocoa uh, uh, very strongly, coffee very strongly. And again, uh, that has to be seen how we fade and, and land that uh, dimension um, in in the, in the UK, and and there is many forms and uh, things, uh, that, uh, actions that can be taken to help, and we actually also in an efficiency drive to help to absorb part of it, but then locally when it has to be, it has to be. We're going to see, and then again, it is not back to back straight away. You have to pace that out, and 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 you have to be empathetic with the consumer, but you have to care also about the substance of your business. Combining that, that's the balancing act that we're always doing. We have increased prices in Brazil, but balancing that out. In Russia, we had to increase certain uh, parts of our business too. I would not uh, 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 ask for more definition for the time being. Let's the dust settle first. The next question is from the call. David Hayes of Merrill Lynch. David, you have the floor. Morning, all. Thank you. Um, firstly, just on the, the sequential profile of the quarter, you've obviously alluded to the fact that the beginning of the quarter was tough due to the pricing shock and the inventory build at the back end of last quarter. Uh, and so I just wonder if I can tempt you to be a little bit more specific about uh, maybe the, the months within the quarter or certainly the beginning of the quarter, the back end of the quarter in terms of the rig. So as you look at the 1.9%, uh, how much better at the end of the, uh, the exiting of the quarter it was. Uh, and then secondly, uh, Mr. Schneider, I believe, has, uh, has been with you now for about six weeks or so, shadowing Paul, uh, I imagine, over, over that period. I just wonder whether you can be a bit more, whether you can tell us what he's been up to uh, in the early uh, days at Nestle, and then I guess more specifically as chairman, Paul, uh, and as part of the board, uh, what kind of objectives and remit you've, uh, you've given uh, Mr. Schneider as he comes into the business beginning of next year formally. Thank you. Maybe I'll take the uh, yeah, first part of the question. No, we, I don't want to comment on months because it's difficult to read anywhere. On the top of it, there were different number of invoicing days in July and August, so it's very difficult to read. Even from time to time for us, it's very difficult to read, and we don't manage the business by the, by the month. My comment earlier was just about Brazil, because we saw some pileup of inventory prior to the, uh, to the price increase in, at the end of Q2, but we went back to a normal situation as far as uh, volume growth is concerned uh, post-price increase for Brazil, but I don't want to comment further on, on any given month specifically. And Mark Schneider, indeed, he's six week, uh, weeks with us. He is uh, the most, uh, I would say, visible uh, trainee we have. And um, um, he is actually not shadowing me um, uh, in that sense. What he does is he gets to merge in, 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 in the company and its operations. He's connecting with, uh, with uh, all the different dimensions of this company here at the center, also in the markets. And um, he is... Uh, uh, with me in certain uh, dimensions, uh, like our executive boards, clearly. So what he does is being a sponge and absorbing uh, this this multifacetical, fascinating dimension Nestle is. So that's that's what he is in for. So um, then you asked about the the objectives as as chairman is to is to be chairman of this company, and I think one of the very important uh, uh, objectives for next year is also to to make sure first that I I assume and uh, get. Um, uh, in the saddle there, um, I, I have the privilege of being part of being part of the board already for for many years, uh, but but also uh, having worked with Peter in continuum, so um, that that's going to help. But then another objective is to make sure that that um, uh, Mark is uh, is uh, very firm and good in the saddle, and and that there is continuum uh, in, in this company. So I think these are the objectives for the time being. Um, thanks. The next question is from James Target of Berenberg. James, you have the floor. Morning, everyone. I um, hope you can hear me this time. Uh, two questions. Uh, firstly, on uh, nutrition, 
Um, just looking at the outlook, really, you've, over the last few quarters, uh, growth has been in the, 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 the 0 to 2 percent range. Um, and going forward, obviously, we've got improving uh, dairy prices. Uh, you mentioned the supply chain issues in the U.S. Um, have been resolved. Um, so should we expect a material pickup in nutrition, or is the volatility surrounding the new regulation in China going to continue to be a big drag, you think, on growth during 2017? Uh, and then secondly, just on uh, an espresso and, and virtue line, I guess clearly the, the rollout into France um, has been driven by a good response in the U.S. Perhaps you could talk about how strong the growth has been of, of virtue line in the U.S. Uh, and also if you have any plans to roll out virtue line sort of further in, in other countries soon. Thank you. Well, on this nutrition, uh, indeed, we had a convergence of quite a f- uh, few, um, um, I would say, soft elements in all, the whole category worldwide. Uh, uh, was soft, or I would say flat. Uh, also, you have to know uh, that uh, in Nestle Nutrition, uh, or no, in the nutrition business per se, China is very important. Uh, uh, worldwide, it's almost half of the business, um, and China has its specifics. Uh, this this whole country is resetting itself also in the expectation of this new law that is actually going to clean up some gray areas and, and formalize uh, this business uh, a little bit more. That goes into our hands. Uh, what we have is, again, uh, yeah, I'm going to be repeating myself again, but um, uh, we had some supply issues uh, by the, the conversion uh, of, of, of a whole product um, uh, category. Uh, the, but, but these are the things that, that uh, are operationally over now. I, I think innovation again, and, 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 and in our infant formulas, uh, definitely we have a major innovation that is now being uh, played that is, uh, is going to give... Uh, also, the, this, this, this impetus to our products. We have been, in spite of the figures you have, we have actually been gaining market shares in many areas, uh, be, be it in infant formulas or cereals, uh, infant cereals, etc. So uh, I do see uh, uh, the whole category uh, with all the players uh, seeing uh, uh, more growth in the, in the future. Uh, the, the milk prices is going to be also pricing. We had some pricing. That should now also play and uh, help us to give a little bit more organic growth, but I do also see uh, potential for volume growth. With Nespresso and, and, and Virtualine in the USA, in, in, in USA, we have good growth. It's uh, uh, double-digit growth in, 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 in Nespresso. Nespresso, and I must say, uh, USA is by, by, by now far also the second biggest market we have in Nespresso. You may remember we were slightly uh, underrepresented there, and that was a little bit uh, hurting us. But now Nespresso is having very good traction, and Virtual Line is really playing into uh, how the uh, USA is seeing a good cup of coffee. It's playing into what they expect from it. Uh, it is another di- different kind of coffee. Uh, the Virtual Line, and hence that's also why it complements very nicely um, uh, what we have as Nespresso, this short uh, um, uh, espresso like coffee. Uh, that's why we also uh, are launching, uh, launching it now in, in, in Europe through uh, France. Are we extending that later on? I think yes, because it has a complementary projection uh, to our offerings. And, and you know that, that uh, coffee is, 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 is our world. We have f- that fantastic brand Nes- Nes- Nespresso to cover the different areas there too in the characteristics, in the uh, personality of Nespresso is what Virtualine does. And then we have also the Nescafe because uh, that's how we see coffee. Uh, we have two fantastic brands uh, uh, arming uh, uh, this, 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 this market very well and complementing the different uh, uh, angles to this market. So, uh, so we see Nespresso uh, with, with a virtual line that complements the offerings we had so far as uh, having uh, continuous growth for the future as it had in the past. Okay. To add some color on virtual line in France, as you know, virtual line is uh, addressing the need for long coffees. What is interesting is France is our largest market as far as Nespresso is concerned, but we cover only 38% of the home consumption, uh, given that uh, short coffees or espressos are only 38% of home consumption of coffee in France. So we are now, with Virtualine, addressing the other 62%. So it's quite an interesting proposition from that point of view. And just coming back to nutrition in China, it's difficult to read what the future will be made of. There are some positives. There is a second child policy, for example, which might impact positively the market. The fact that milk prices internationally have increased significantly recently. Uh, the fact that the gray market is somewhat uh, stabilizing or uh, getting reduced significantly. All of this is moving in the, in the positive direction. That being said, we still expect some, not turbulences, but a little bit difficult time maybe in the short term. 
given that there is a fairly large level of inventory in the trade, not necessarily for us, but overall for the industry. So there is a risk that uh, ahead of the legislation, some traders might be tempted to dump uh, product or to reduce prices in the short term. So we remain quite cautious still as far as China is concerned for uh, infant nutrition. Thank you. And the next question from the call is from Mitch Collett of Goldman Sachs. Mitch, you have the floor. Hi there. Um, you talked about stepping up marketing spend, uh, and we can see that marketing and admin has increased as a percentage of sales pretty consistently since 2012. But you're about to report your fifth straight year of organic growth slowdown. Do you think you're getting an adequate return on your marketing spend? Um, and I guess what would it look like if you hadn't have kept increasing? And then secondly, I just wanted to ask, on the pricing environment in the US. Why do you think that has deteriorated given that soft commodities are generally starting to rise? Um, and did that mean that your organic sales growth in the US was in decline this quarter? Thank you. Did you get the second part? More or less. Uh, we had a very bad connection, so I heard uh, the second part. Now, uh, let me first go to the... PFME has gone up, and, 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 and you say, how do you uh, compare that with an organic growth that is slowing down? Well. Uh, uh, part of that slowing down of the organic growth is, is, is linked with uh, very, very low prices. Uh, so for me, uh, over marketing spend is not uh, to justify prices, it's just to create value, is to um, uh, explore new venues, new offerings to the consumer, etc. So our PFME goes up, uh, and you have always to challenge, um, uh, is it wisely spent? And, and that is uh, uh, something that also digital helps us to do even better, to focus and uh, even better these uh, these uh, these investments but i i think it it is intrinsic to our strategy that i see the support behind our brands the connection with consumers the personalization of offerings is is like inducing a, a, a higher support behind uh, our portfolios and behind our brands um, i think also um, the, the the new venues that we are exploring are definitely more added value um, so more, I would say, um, uh, benefits built into uh, uh, the, the, our products and brands. Millenniums, call it the millennium phenomena, as a consumer and uh, consumer, that, that uh, the, the, the relationship with uh, that kind of consumer is more intense, hence also uh, more PFME. So I think uh, uh, it is, the PFME is linked also with the business models and the business offerings we have. It's not just to force uh, growth uh, per se, but as a consequence of that deeper engagement, as a consequence of that more intense innovation with more uh, brand support, yes, indeed, it should uh, flourish back into uh, more growth. Volume growth we have already, I, mean, I repeat again, at the higher end of the industry, that's the effect of having uh, continued investing in our, in our brands. The, 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 line, the, the line was not very good, but I think you were talking about the pricing in the US. We are clearly, as far as the food and beverage industry is concerned, in a negative, uh, with a negative trend from pricing. So clearly deflation in the US. Volume is not that great either. I think the market, food and beverage market, even declined by volume last year, which is probably the first time it happened in the US history. So in that context, we are quite happy actually to still grow in the US, and we are gaining market share overall in the US as a combination of uh, both a positive uh, volume and uh, some negative pricing as well, but overall we are gaining market share. But I in think US. you ask if uh, you think that we are softening uh, and even going down in pricing in the United States. Well, it is at the same vein and the same uh, level as as uh, the, the 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 first half. In that sense, that there is no softening or losing, uh, but it's on a low level. And, uh, and actually, in certain categories, we're going to see how that's going to play out and mix. We have some price increases, uh, uh, like in Nestle Skin Health, and etc. that's going to start playing out uh, more positively. Thanks. And the next question from the call is from Celine Panuti of JP Morgan. Celine, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, good morning. Um, first question uh, is on the volume growth in your categories. Um, is it possible for you to tell us 
what do you think is right now the volume demand uh, in your categories across the globe? Uh, you mentioned that you know you have a, a better uh, rig and volume performance than, than peers. Uh, I just was wondering whether uh, we also see uh, the risk of further decline as you are going to face tougher comp uh, on AOA uh, from next year, uh, and overall whether effectively you are going to feel the, uh, the pressure of a lower uh, demand. Uh, that's number one. And number two, could you uh, share with us the performance in China, uh, what has growth rate done uh, in the quarter? And Yin Lu seems to have deteriorated. Uh, so uh, what exactly, I mean, I think that they were uh, effectively relaunched. You did say that it will take time, but what is uh, now uh, the further uh, step down in that performance? Thank you. The first question was... Uh, the, the first question you asked about the volume uh, grows by category. W we operate in quite a large number of categories, so it's difficult to cover all of them. Overall, the market, the food and beverage market by volume is close to zero, slightly positive, uh, and we are doing better than the market, actually. We have the highest, I think, the highest or one of the highest growth by volume in the industry, which we clearly see, and we see that in all our categories, with one exception, though, which is confectionery. Um, For what is China, actually, it's a little bit frustrating because there is indeed quite a lot of good stuff and, 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 and growth happening in, in very, very different categories we have. I think about uh, coffee. Nescafe, for example, is growing very handsomely. Uh, we have also our uh, biscuit confectionery is, very, is growing very well. Uh, we have actually on the platform of Yinlu, the platform of the company Yinlu, very good things happening like uh, our... Our um, and Nescafe RTD is growing double digit. Uh, we, we launched a Shakismo that is going uh, and having a good, very good takeoff. Uh, we have a, um, a Milo RTD on that platform that is very uh, going well. It is this, this, this specific uh, peanut milk uh, that was wrong and is still a wrong food that we have, cleaned the label, etc. And it is by, in proportion big. So that is why it overshadows a lot of what's happening in China, and that we have to tackle, and and we are in the process. We have reformulated. We are uh, differentiating the positioning. So it's a little bit the whole marketing mix again, and it takes time. That combined with actually a food and beverage industry in China that is give and take flat. Um, uh, that that is what what hurts us in China. That combined with the size we have there uh, is is overshadowing so much. Th that's actually the story of. Now, uh, China is a fantastic place to be. Uh, food and beverage in general is, 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 is the, a dimension that has project of growth. You see soft pricing now here, et cetera, to the inflationary environment in China. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, uh, so, but that's going to take colors back. And so we have very good elements of, of growth in China, uh, but overshadowed somewhere by that specific uh, uh, issue um, that is also linked with what you actually see in China. Uh, there's a whole resetting that goes much deeper than just destocking, what we have had in the last two years, uh, that linked with the slow growth. There's a whole resetting, redefining of, of distribution. Uh, uh, we have mentioned that, that we had quite a lot of stocks in, 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 in the multi-layer distributor structure that you had. Um, uh, we had something like three, four layers sometimes of distributors to get to the small uh, uh, shops. And in the past, to a certain extent, it was uh, distribution, growth, uh, when you're in an upswing, um, was done by, by many players and partly also by us, by, by actually calling it land grabbing. It's, it's, it's going and, and engaging with a new distributor, going to a, a city um, uh, from one to two, city four, and, 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 and lower and smaller villages by engaging new distributors. Now what's happening is with this slower growth and more fragile distributors uh, with less financial, etc., are going out of business. Uh, so there's a de-engaging of quite a lot of dimensions of distribution. That combined with, with the march of e-commerce, and e-commerce is important to us uh, there too. So uh, well, it is growing uh, very handsomely for us. It's all already way above 10% of our uh, uh, business in China, in certain businesses, it's uh, touching 50%. Uh, pet care uh, is 25%, for example, and growing very fast. Uh, but that's resetting uh, a whole, I would say, road to market 
or getting connection physically the product uh, products to uh, to to the market. So uh, it entails opportunities, but there is correction. And I think also what we learned there in China is going to be reverse inspiration for many things we're going to see happening in the other parts of the world. So uh, um, I see this as a huge opportunity, but we have to we have to yes indeed. Uh, try to get out of that overshadowing dimension of Yindu, and that's uh, what we're doing. It lasts longer, it's deeper, because it combines with other, other uh, uh, negatives that are a little bit out of our reach, but uh, that we live in. Thanks. And the next question from the call is from Patrick Schwendiman of the ZKV. Uh, Patrick, you have the floor. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Francois. What's your best guess expectation for the environment for 2017 for the emerging markets, e.g. China, Brazil, and Africa, and for the developed markets, e.g. US and Europe? That's my first question. And secondly, what does this mean for organic growth for 2017? And uh, similar growth to 2016 or better? Thank you. We're not even finishing 2016, and you're asking me already for 2017 and etc. I, I, look, uh, Worldwide growth is projected to be, what, 3, slightly over 3%, which is not. And we all feel depressed and saying, look, uh, this is bad. And uh, I just want to remember that uh, before this, uh, I would say, these easier golden years that we had before the crisis, uh, this crisis, already eight years ago, um, that was golden age. But it was a uh, growth of worldwide growth of 4, 4 point something percent and all that. But before that, 20 years, average, 3.5% 3, 3 max. So uh, to a certain extent, we, we, we get used to, uh, to growth uh, figures that, that sometimes in the past we didn't have and we forget it. Now, 3% uh, plus, I can, uh, we should um, be able to grow um, uh, uh, above that, but, but, but that's, uh, that's a projection. On the emerging and developed markets, it is known and it's projected, and that's why we have always said we're an ant company. That's why we never disengage from the Europe of this world. And that's why we always have always grown in these markets. Through the whole crisis, we never had one year of no growth, of no growth in Europe, Western Europe. I do, and, and it is projected that the worldwide growth, value growth, in spite of emerging markets catching up, worldwide growth, 50% of the worldwide uh, GDP growth is going to come from developed markets. So that's why we don't disengage from there. And it's going to be different. It's going to be different yeah, venues, or different offerings. Uh, uh, food, I do feel, uh, food, diets is going to gain. Uh, so I'm speaking longer term now. But, but that's, that's why I think uh, there's no such thing as, well, growth is going to be in the emerging markets more than the developed markets. I don't think that. Uh, we have to maintain that and dimension in, in, in the offering. The emerging markets is going to be, again, uh, um, a painting of different colors. Uh, uh, we, we all say, well, China, China, but China as a country uh, is, is, is growing, and it is growing on a much big, bigger base. We have the food and beverage uh, in a resetting somewhere, but the country as such is growing. Uh, softer pace, but on a bigger base. Uh, Russia, uh, uh, challenge, we are growing very handsomely in Russia this year, and uh, there is some pricing too, but we have volume growth. Uh, so, I think again that that's the resilience of 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 our of our industry um, that combined with innovation. There I go again. Uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil uh, is in turbulent times. Uh, there is instability and all. But uh, again, we have we have this local uh, savoir faire uh, and, and of understanding the idiosyncrasies. We have the we have people there. But then again, uh, the Mexicos of this world growing very well. Uh, we and then you have. Because we are always India, uh, grow projections, and we're going out of our uh, uh, troubles there uh, very handsomely too. So, uh, but we speak about these big blocks, and then you add the many smaller ones, and, and they have sh very good dynamics. The Philippines, uh, Indonesia for us, Vietnam for that matter. You go to Africa and uh, what we call Sea War, Central West Africa region, uh, and uh, there's turbulence in there too. But that was always part of, of the world in certain places and growing there very, very good. So I, I, I'm going to stop here because you're going to say I'm too optimistic, but uh, I don't project any figures. Uh, I, I don't think it's all of a sudden a flip-flop and we're going to get into an environment of, of again, 
No, I'm cautious, uh, and we will be cautious. Uh, but I, I, I do believe there is opportunity, and it is exactly that uh, why we are investing. Thanks. And the next question from the call is from Martin Dubu of Jeffries. Uh, Martin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Two quick questions. I'd like to come back to John Cox's question on the margin outlook. Uh, François Javi being very clear that there's going to be an increased restructuring burden on the trading margin in H2. Uh, but my question is, what about underlying margin? Pricing is sequentially improving. You're not yet seeing the worst of commodity inflation. I don't know what's happening to marketing. You know, what would we expect to see in terms of the underlying margin outlook in H2? And the second one is just really a very simple question, leaving aside your hedging and forward buying. Just how is your commodity basket moving at the moment at, at spot prices? Okay, on, the margin, on the margin side, indeed, uh, I think you're right that we will have to look probably in the next couple of quarters at the margin before restructuring because we will have more restructuring costs in the second half of 16 and we will have uh, some significant amount again in 17. We'll come back to you on due time with amounts because we are still working on a certain number of projects and finalizing it. Um, we, you could see that our margin before restructuring had increased by 30 basis points in June. Well, that being said, we don't give... Uh, uh, any forward-looking statement as far as uh, margin is concerned, beyond the fact that we will increase our trading operating margin. You have seen as well that our gross margin has increased significantly, uh, 380 basis points, I think, over the last four years. This is something that we continue working upon in order to continue improving our margin as a consequence of pricing and as a consequence of cost efficiency. So that, that will remain. And will allow us to continue as well investing further in marketing, as Paul said, and investing further as well in uh, R&D. Uh, talking about commodities, we have seen some uh, increase in commodity pricing in terms of our basket of commodity pricing over the last two to three quarters. I can talk about uh, milk and coffee and cocoa or even palm oil. Uh, it was a little bit less obvious, I would say, the increase maybe over the last uh, quarter, but Still, we believe that we have hit probably the bottom probably two quarters ago and might have reached an inflection point. I uh, could mention oil as well, because oil impacts, for example, uh, our water business through PET. Um, so we are, as you know, and as I mentioned earlier, we have edging policies in place, so which means that we don't necessarily need to reflect it in our pricing uh, in the very short term, but there might be a time when we have to uh, uh, reflect it. Uh, price increases is not always the answer that we have. I'm just reflecting back again on the UK situation. Whenever we have an increase in input cost, the first thing that we do is really to work at uh, cost efficiencies. Uh, because, I mean, obviously price increases is the easy part, but it is largely linked to competitive forces in a given market. So the first answer is immediately to look at cost efficiencies in order to be able to remain as competitive it, as, competitive as we can. But we see... We see some uh, some pickup there, and and and, and Francois mentioned uh, milk was on a historical low, and 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 then uh, it is not healthy to have uh, extremely low commodity prices. It is a very unstabilizing factor. I think also for an economy to have a, a slight um, uh, low inflation is is is. Is like a stabilizer, and uh, and that's deflationary environment. Remember, that is a very difficult thing once you get really into it uh, to get out. So, um, but also low um, uh, commodity prices um, is not good because it is, it conditions the lives of so many people in the world, and and so um, we see some color coming back in the, the broader uh, form, and much softer and slower than we thought, and that is reflecting also why we. Uh, revisiting some figures, but much softer than we thought, uh, if you see historically, etc. So that reflects again the softer trading environment, and you go on. But I think uh, once we get a little bit of that momentum back, uh, I hope that, that they will be on a moderated pace, but firm, and not like we had this, this dramatic, dramatic low uh, uh, raw material prices. And that's a false impression to have. That helps us. Well, uh, it, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't help. So uh, I, it's softer than we thought, but it's at least coming back some colors, uh, specifically in, in in base raw materials, cocoa, uh, over time. Again, to cocoa, coffee, and, and milk for us. 
Um, and then we see the impact of oil prices. We have to wait to see what, what's happening in there. They have some, 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 uh, how firm is that? And, and that affects then also, so quite, quite, uh, definitely quite uh, importantly, uh, uh, agricultural materials. <coughs> Thanks. And the next question from the call is from Jeff Stent of Exxon. Jeff, you have the floor. Uh, good morning. Um, just one qu quick question. Um, I think I'm correct in saying it's the last time that Paul will be addressing this audience as CEO. And you know, reflecting on your last eight years, Paul, you know, if you were to say what your one biggest achievement's been and your one biggest regret, um, what would they be? Yeah. I don't like, well, but still sitting here is a good thing, right? Um, <laughs> I, 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 I never speak uh, uh, about legacy, it's about this, etc. But at the end of the day, we, uh, and that's all the people who have been part of this journey also, these were not easy years. Um, uh, these, these, these were actually eight years with the crisis, and, and you go on, and tur turbulences, a combination of uh, macroeconomics, but also societal, uh, political, uh, 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 also uh, technologies, um, this, and I, say, I call it as an inflection point. I think it's fascinating, uh, the opportunities it gives, but at the same time, I think we went steady, relatively steady to, through all that. Uh, and that is somewhere a point that we all can uh, be, be, be proud of, because these were turbulent times. We, did, uh, we didn't weave through these holes uh, uh, all these years and have been delivering, as I mentioned, also in the developed markets growth. And maintained our agenda, and, and 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 yes, we have to reset certain dimensions and all that. Uh, and and good, I would say, reaction on realism and and pra pragmatically. But but at the end of the day, being able to do that and and investing for the future, I think that's important. Uh, having having done uh, in my eyes the right things, and and and, and balancing the short term turbulences, etc., and yet doing what uh, what what it needs to 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 get uh, stronger. I think this company is definitely uh, s stronger and uh, when, when, when then some, some more environmental tailwind is gonna come, that's gonna be uh, much more visible. But uh, uh, that I would say is, is something that, uh, that uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we're proud of. And um, so that's basically, was there another part of the question? I, uh, regrets. The what, sorry? Regrets, if any. That it was so fast going over and by. I mean, eight years indeed, and it is very fast. That's what we get. Uh, that it goes fast, and somewhere it does it end. I'm so happy. I'm still going to be part of it from another angle, and that I can still serve this company. Uh, that I have dedicated my well, yeah, 37 years is not bad so far. That's uh, maybe a regret. Okay, thanks. The next question is from Alain Oberhuber of Maine First. Alain, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Two questions. Just regarding um, the, the, the growth again. Do I understand it right that we expect now similar pricing, but an, ex but an acceleration in the uh, in the organic growth, uh, in particular in the in the RIC? And then for next year, there's obviously a high base in H1. Would we expect that the organic growth next year is more geared and skewed to the second half? And my second question is regarding the U.S. Uh, frozen dish business. Could you give us a little bit more insight about the development of uh, Stauffer's uh, pizza as well as out of pocket, please? Maybe you okay. ask the first part. On Stauffer's and Lean Cuisine, I must say, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we continue uh, uh, getting market share. Uh, last year we had a good... Um, um, uh, I would say resetting, good, very good growth. That growth is, 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 is a little bit less now on better growth of last year, and that's gonna, but still growth and gaining market share. So I think uh, we're doing the right thing. What we should not do is falling in the trap again of we re relaunched and, and that's it, and that's why we have a permanent uh, revamping uh, the category and our uh, portfolio now. And uh, it, it, it has and it, it comp um, it, it continues to, to, to give us a good promise of, 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 of growth for the future. And um, uh, that in Lean Cuisine and in Stover's and in Hot Pockets. Uh, so uh, it is really uh, quite motivating. 
on this balancing. I, I, on the balancing, as, you, as Paul said earlier, let us finish our 2017 budget first before we talk about the phasing. I think it's far too early to talk about the phasing between H1 and H2. On the question on pricing acceleration, as I mentioned earlier, we don't expect any pricing at this stage, at least in the short term in the Western countries. Uh, we are still in a deflationary environment and there is no evidence of a turnaround there. It could happen later, maybe in 2017, once again, if commodity pricing was really picking up. But uh, once again, there is a delay between market prices and what we reflect uh, to the market. And in uh, developing markets that could be, in emerging market, there could be a little bit more pricing. Uh, for example, what we did in, in Brazil is largely linked to foreign exchange pressure, which translates into additional input cost. So there might be a little bit more of it uh, in Latin America or in Eastern Europe, um, um, probably in the later part of 2017 again. Thanks. And the, fi and the final question uh, is from uh, David Edward Jones of RBC. Uh, James, you have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you. Francois, um, you mentioned that there'd be a need to look at margins before restructuring costs. Can I just confirm that your outlook for the year for margin growth uh, refers to margins after restructuring costs? Yes, so we will increase our trading operating margin after restructuring costs while increasing the restructuring amount in 2016 over 2015. I can't give you the amount of restructuring because we are still finalizing it. It depends. I mean, the cut of debt is, has a significant influence on the amount that we could book. But we know already that even while increasing restructuring cost in 2016, we will improve our trading operating margin. This is once again part of our model and part of our guidance. So, so we commit to a figure uh, of margin improvement. Uh, covering that additional uh, uh, more intense restructuring. And uh, I think it's, again, balancing things out, not resetting or asking for a moratorium. I think that that's, that's the quality uh, of what we promise. Um, Your closing remarks? Well, no. Uh, look, these are uh, soft trading env environments, et cetera, et cetera. But, but for, I just want to this balancing of, 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 of short term, but also having quality in our sales, uh, uh, which I see in that dimension of vo volume, which is not volume for volume, it, it represents something that is um, as leading in many categories that we own also towards the category to ourselves to drive categories. And I think uh, uh, there was not quite a few years of accelerated changes in all these categories. Uh, we. we we are engaging, re-engaging, connecting, reconnecting, etc. But the growth was always there. And that is what I, I see the quality to be in the higher end of the industry, we say. But, but, but because we also uh, lead in quite a few uh, categories and, 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 and yes, I'm indeed building the capabilities of compete. Uh, to be competitive is to be able to compete and that is what we're investing in. At the same time, there's a more uh, longer term, it's uh, uh, this innovation. Uh, I cannot stress enough the importance of keeping a, a, a mindset but also an engagement and resources behind innovation. And that is linked again with, with science, it's uh, knowledge, but it's engaging in different models. It is also uh, uh, maintaining, and, and in, a, in, in a company like ours, it, uh, uh, it is a sizable company with, with a lot of, I would say, um, uh, also tradition and history and all, which is a strength could be a liability. Not to make it, and I will allow it to be a liability, is uh, reinventing ourselves. Hence, uh, I use the word NBE. Uh, uh, it is to, um, it is to uh, really uh, restructure and reassess and be more efficient and be, and be much more uh, effective. That is in the process we are in, and I am very much uh, uh, positive uh, for the future. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you th th very much. Thank you, Paul. And as usual, we're happy to take any follow-up questions via email or Twitter. I'm sure you know the addresses. Thank you very much.